The late Thomas Silverstein and Charles Bronson have frequently been cited as being the scariest prison inmates, both having committed numerous crimes while incarcerated. But here we'll look at five criminals who have committed such heinous crimes and shown so little remorse for their acts that they will spend the rest of their lives in prison, and truly are some of the scariest and most dangerous prison inmates alive today. Our thoughts and sympathies go out to all of the families affected by the deeds of these violent and dangerous people. Now before we begin, we'd like to say a big thank you to this video's sponsor, Magellan TV. If you've tuned into a Top 5's video in the last few months, odds are you've heard us rave about our exciting partnership with Magellan TV, the best source for the hottest and most intriguing true crime content available online. You know about their curated documentaries and bingeable television shows, and how they go beyond the realm of true crime to deliver unbelievably deep dives into other topics, such as space or history or the supernatural. In other words, there is always something to watch, no matter where your interests lay. To give you a better glance into the plethora of videos within the Magellan TV library, we want to talk a little more in depth about one of our favorite titles we've recently watched, that we know will make you fall in love with the service all over again. This week we want to highlight the documentary, Great Bank Heists, a 53 minute documentary giving us a blood pumping rundown of all the most fascinating heists that took place in real life. When you think of the greatest heist movies produced by the film industry, you think of Ocean's Eleven, or Heat, or Inside Man, all featuring elaborate schemes with cunning characters and explosive thefts. But what if we told you the real world heists were more thrilling than their fictional counterparts? That's one of our favorite aspects of this documentary, how it never strays from the truth, yet tells the story in a way that is sure to keep you hooked until the end. It also makes viewers think deeper about the institutions around us and how we are all vulnerable to criminals, as long as they are determined to get what they want. It's the perfect mix of spectacle and reflection, exactly how we curate our own videos on top fives. And while Great Bank Heists isn't a new release, Magellan TV does add 15 to 20 hours of brand new content, just like it to their library each week, always leaving fans of true crime and other relevant topics with something fresh to escape into. So stop waiting, use the link in the description to access a free month trial, and jump into the jaw-dropping history of Great Bank Heists and other top-notch documentaries. You won't regret it. And now, hit those lights. Sit back and enjoy. Joanna Dennehy Since its launch in the UK in 1983, only three women have ever been sentenced to serve whole life orders. That is, to remain in prison until they die. Those women are Myra Hindley, Rose West, and Joanna Dennehy. Hindley, though now dead, and West are both internationally renowned. Hindley for her role in the depraved Moors murders, and West for killings that took place in her home, the infamous 25 Cromwell Street. Joanna Dennehy is less known outside Britain, and though her victims are fewer, the nature of her crimes, her startling lack of remorse, and the behaviour she has exhibited, even since her incarceration, mark her out as a highly dangerous individual. During a 10-day period in March to April 2013, Dennehy, 30 years old at the time, and a mother of two daughters, callously murdered three men. Her first victim was 31-year-old Lukas Slaboszewski. A Polish national, Dennehy had only met a few days before she killed him. After sending him a series of flirtatious text messages, Lukas visited her home in Petersburg, only for Dennehy to stab him in the heart upon his arrival. She allegedly stored his body in a bin, later showing it to a teenage girl who lived nearby, before disposing of the corpse. Dennehy's next victim was her housemate, John Chapman, aged 56. After stabbing him numerous times, she called her friend and accomplice Gary Stretch, who arrived with his friend, Leslie Layton. The duo then helped her move the body out of the bedsit she shared with Chapman. Lastly, Dennehy killed her 48-year-old landlord, Kevin Lee. Thought to have been instigated by an argument over unpaid rent, she stabbed him in the chest. Dennehy then dressed Lee, whom she had also a sexual relationship with, in a black sequin dress, and dumped his body in a ditch near the Cambridge Fens, a process she had already used with her previous victims. 
On the 2nd of April 2013, Dennehy drove 140 miles to Hereford with Stretch and Leighton, where Dennehy stabbed two men within a 10 minute period, though luckily both men survived. Dennehy was later arrested in Hereford, where her apparent absence of concern, along with her brazen flirtatiousness towards an officer, is caught on camera at the police station. Dennehy pled guilty during her trial and claimed to have no regret over the death of her three victims, though she admitted to feeling some remorse over the two counts of attempted murder she had been charged with. This conflicts with her earlier confession to a psychiatrist, to whom she had admitted that she found murder Moorish, and with her behaviour in court, Dennehy laughed in the dock as the judge branded her a cruel, calculated, selfish and manipulative serial killer. She was sentenced to spend life in prison with no chance for parole in February 2014. This is the first instance of a judge sentencing a criminal to a whole life order, as this decree is usually decided by the Home Secretary. Initially, Dennehy was sent to HMP Bronzefield in Surrey, where plans she had made to escape were discovered in her cell. She had intended to murder a guard and use the severed finger of another in order to bypass a biometric security system. This led Dennehy to be held in solitary confinement for two years, before being transferred to HMP Low Newton in 2008. Upon arrival, Dennehy made threats against the life of fellow Low Newton inmate Rose West. These were taken seriously, and West was hastily transferred to HMP Newhall in Yorkshire. Dennehy has bragged about her crimes whilst in prison, has threatened and planned to hurt others, and has committed acts to self-harm as well, all of which would seem to justify the severity of the sentence she has been given. Ramsey Youssef Imprisoned in the Maximum Security Facility, ADX Florence, Ramsey Youssef has carried out and planned some of the most ambitious terrorist attacks to be uncovered. He is also the nephew of Khalid Sikh Mohammed, the suspected main strategist behind the 2001 attack on the World Trade Center. Chillingly, Youssef orchestrated an assault which foreshadowed his uncle's later, more devastating plot. Born in Kuwait in 1968, Youssef travelled to the UK to study and improve his English language skills. After completing a degree in electrical engineering at Swansea University in Wales, Youssef returned to his home country, but left again after the 1990 invasion of Iraq. It is at this point he became involved in terrorist activity and he spent time in both Afghanistan and Pakistan, learning how to construct bombs. He also established contacts in the Philippines with the jihadist group Abu Sayyaf before traveling to the USA in 1992. Here Youssef assembled a team and spent months planning his attack on the World Trade Center. On the 26th of February 1993, Youssef and his fellow terrorists placed a 1500 pound bomb in a rental van and detonated it in a garage underneath the World Trade Center. This resulted in the deaths of six people and left over 1000 injured. Though his associates were caught, Youssef escaped to Pakistan. Despite initially laying low, Youssef went on to plot the assassination of the Pakistani Prime Minister, Benazir Bhutto, a few months later. It's claimed that Youssef made multiple attempts on Bhutto's life, which were aborted due to a detonator exploding in his face, leading his accomplices to rush him to hospital, and another failing due to the gun Youssef planned to use not coming into his possession in time. Again, Youssef evaded capture and went into hiding. From 1994, Youssef scaled up his level of involvement in terror-related activity, though thankfully, not all of his operations were successful. He was part of an attempt to bomb the Israeli embassy in Bangkok in early 1994, a plan that only failed due to the van carrying the bombs crashing into a motorcyclist, which resulted in the driver fleeing and abandoning the vehicle. Later that year, he was responsible for the bombing of Shiite in Iran, which resulted in the death of 26 people. In December 1994, he planted a bomb on Philippine Airlines Flight 434, traveling from Manila to Tokyo. 
Yusef travelled under an assumed name, assembled the bomb on board and planted it under a seat. He later disembarked and the bomb detonated mid-air, killing one man and injuring at least 20 more. As the bomb had been planted far away enough from the fuel tank, a larger, more lethal explosion was averted and the plane managed to make a successful emergency landing. Yusef returned to Manila, where he continued to make explosive devices. This led to the outbreak of a fire in his apartment, which he fled, leaving evidence of his activities in his wake. The suspicious staff at the complex contacted the Philippine authorities, who searched his apartment and discovered Yusef's plans for further terrorist attacks, including crashing an aircraft into the CIA headquarters in Virginia. Airlines were alerted, and a search for Yusef, already on the FBI's most wanted list, after the World Trade Center attack intensified. He was eventually captured in a hotel in Pakistan on the 7th of February 1995. Considering Youssef had planned further atrocities, including the assassination of Pope John Paul II and President Bill Clinton, as well as plotting to bomb 11 airliners traveling from Asia to the USA, it was an arrest that didn't come a moment too soon. Youssef was sent to the United States to stand trial for his crimes and was found guilty of bombing the World Trade Center and for planning to carry out further acts of terrorism. For this, he was sentenced to serve a life sentence plus 240 years, therefore ensuring that this relentless criminal will never be free to commit acts of death and destruction ever again. Niels Hogel Much like Beverly Allett, the English nurse who was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of four children and the attempted murder of others under her care, so too is Niels Hogel considered an angel of death killer, but one whose numbers of victims has far surpassed all its, and seems to be continually rising. An angel of death killer is one that fulfills the role of a caregiver, and the rationale behind murdering their victims generally falls under one of three reasons. It can be in the guise of mercy, the individual may genuinely believe that by killing their patients they are releasing them from suffering, whether this is true or not. It may be due to a sadistic desire to exert the power of life or death over their victim, or it could be because the perpetrator falls under the description of a malignant hero. That is, they wish to be seen to make an attempt to save their victim, earning them praise and attention, despite knowing their efforts may be futile. Niels Hogel is known to fall under this latter category. Born in 1976, Hogel began a career in nursing in 1999, and worked at two hospitals in northern Germany until 2005. It was at this point that a colleague working alongside Hogel in a facility in the city of Dalmenhorst caught him injecting a patient with an unprescribed dose of Ajmaline, a drug used for treating the cardiac condition, Brugada syndrome. Hogel was promptly arrested and at his trial in 2008 was found guilty of attempted murder and was subsequently sentenced to seven years in prison. However, after the relative of another one of his deceased patients claimed to believe that Hogel may have been behind the death of their loved one, police launched a fresh investigation into his work history. They discovered that Hogel was dubbed the Lifesaver Rambo, as he was known to push colleagues out of the way in order to try and resuscitate a patient. The authorities also discovered that when Hogel was working, patient deaths and attempted resuscitations doubled in number. A trial that began in 2014 saw Hogel convicted of two counts of murder and two attempted murders, although he dramatically confessed to killing 30 people. Since then, this number has risen steadily, and many patients that died at the two hospitals during Hogel's employment have been exhumed in order to detect the presence of Ajmaline. In 52 cases, Hogel has claimed he simply cannot recall if he was responsible for the patient's death or not. The true death toll attributed to Hogel is shockingly thought to stand anywhere between 200 and 300, giving the dubious honour of being Germany's worst ever peacetime serial killer. Hogel is currently undergoing a third trial for his crimes. He has publicly apologised for his horrific acts, and this no doubt offers little comfort to the heartbroken families of his victims, and to relatives of those who died under his care, who may never know if Hogel murdered their family member or not. He has been sentenced to life imprisonment, currently for the deaths of 85 people. Juana Barraza 
The tragic early life of Juana Barraza and the deadliest crimes she went on to commit have led TV studios in both her native Mexico and in the US to create characters and shows based on her. Barraza was born to an alcoholic mother in 1957 in Hidalgo, Mexico, and endured a sad and abusive childhood. Reputedly, Barraza's mother gave her 12-year-old daughter away to a man in exchange for three bottles of beer. The girl's new guardian sexually abused her, resulting in the birth of at least one child to him. Understandably, this fueled a hatred within the young girl towards her callous mother, and it is this emotional response which decided the profile of Barraza's victims. Barraza grew up to be fascinated with the Mexican art of lucha libre, a distinctive form of wrestling, where participants are masked and wear colorful costumes. A stocky woman, Barraza sometimes performed in amateur wrestling events under the stage name of La Dama del Silencio, or the Lady of Silence. Whilst supplementing her income, which by now had to cover the cost of caring for her four children by working as a popcorn seller at wrestling matches, Barraza, however, developed another persona, one which led her to become known as the Old Lady Killer. Barraza's crime spree started in Mexico City in the late 1990s, and she had two specific methods for selecting her victims. She targeted elderly, lone women, sometimes approaching them outside and offering to help them home with their shopping, or to assist them with their housework. Barraza had also somehow obtained a list of residents receiving government aid, and from this, she selected aged female victims. She would then visit the chosen women at home, and with the aid of a government ID card, would pose as a dutiful social worker, offering advice on assistance projects and financial aid that may be available to her unwitting victim. Once Barraza had gained entrance to the woman's property, she would promptly correct them, often utilizing tights or a telephone cord, and she would take trophies like religious trinkets from the scene of her crime. Troublingly, the bodies of her victims also bore signs that they had been sexually violated. A police profile informed by witness testimonies that a broad-shouldered, heavily built woman had been seen leaving the scene of one of the crimes Barraza committed led police to believe the perpetrator could be a cross-dresser. Precious time was lost by police arresting and questioning many members of this community, much to their outrage, and Barraza continued her murderous rampage. It was only in 2006 that police finally caught her. After strangling 82-year-old Anne Maria de los Reyes Alfaro with a stethoscope, Barraza, now 48, was spotted leaving the premises by Alfaro's tenant, who alerted the police. Barraza was swiftly arrested in the local vicinity and once questioned, confessed to three murders. Committed, she claimed out of anger, but protested that she was not involved in any further crimes. Despite this, Barraza's fingerprints were matched to 10 other murders, though she was eventually charged and found guilty of 16 counts of murder and aggravated burglary in a 2008 trial. It's thought, however, that she may be responsible for between 42 and 48 murders. Juana Barraza was sentenced to 759 years in prison, meaning that the now 62-year-old former wrestler turned serial killer will never be released. Mikhail Popkov Mikhail Popkov terrorized the city of Angarsk for 20 years, raping and killing women from the area to such a savage degree that he was nicknamed both the Angarsk Maniac and the Werewolf. Incarcerated since 2012, Popkov is now considered Russia's most prolific serial killer. Born in the city that would become his hunting ground in 1964, there is little information available about Popkov's formative years he grew up to marry and have a daughter, and worked as a police officer for some years, before taking a job as a security guard. It was under the guise of working as a trusted law enforcement agent that many of Popkov's victims met their fate. From 1992, Popkov trawled the streets of Angas in his police car at night, looking for intoxicated women leaving clubs or bars, and would offer them a lift home. Once they were in his car, Popkov would take his passenger to the quiet of nearby woodland, and brutally rape and kill them. Popkov used an assortment of weapons, including screwdrivers, axes, and knives, to murder his victims. Sickeningly, some bodies were reportedly found with as many as 145 stab wounds, and others had been decapitated or had organs removed. 
Amazingly, one of the two victims to survive being attacked by Popkov, a young woman, managed to positively identify him in 1998. After telling officers that it was a policeman who had assaulted her, the 17-year-old confirmed that Popkov was her assailant. After questioning, officers showed her a photograph of him. However, Popkov's wife, disbelieving that her husband was capable of such a crime, provided him with a false alibi. The authorities believing their employee to be innocent, therefore disregarded her claims. This enabled Popkov to remain at large for a further 14 years. Eventually, police narrowed their field of suspects after discovering the car tracks from a Lada Niva, an off-road vehicle commonly used by the Russian police, were found at several of the crime scenes. The police took DNA samples from 230,000 Angas residents, including 3,500 officers, and compared them to DNA evidence found on the victims. This led to Popkov's arrest in 2012. Finally, the women of Angas were safe. In 2015, Popkov was convicted for 22 counts of murder and two counts of attempted murder. However, three years later, he admitted to yet another 59 murders, including that of one fellow policeman. Due to insufficient evidence for three of the murders, Popkov was given an additional life sentence for 56 further killings, though his final victim tally is thought to be anywhere between 78 and 84. Popkov has explained his actions were motivated by a desire to clean the streets of Siberian cities of immoral women. He had spared women to whom he had offered a lift, but who had declined, deeming them as moral. He often helped them home and carried their shopping into their house, before leaving them unharmed. Troublingly, unrepentant, he will live out the rest of his life in the maximum Black Dolphin prison, located near the border of Kazakhstan. So, that's five extraordinarily dangerous and scary criminals who are thankfully behind bars. We hope you found this video interesting, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.